All right, hey guys, I'm going to try to get through two sections again today. This adiabatic process one is always one that kids kind of struggle with, which is why I kind of assigned an Ed puzzle to hopefully get that idea into your head. And the reason it's usually a struggle is because previously we had said volume and temperature. We would have had a relationship like this. Right? We would have said, well, they're uh, directly proportional. Right? If they're moving faster, they have a higher temperature, then they need more space. Right? So an increase in temperature would cause an increase in volume. Okay? But the key on that is all of our gas laws that we had learned and worked with before we had kind of an asterisk by them that said all else being constant. Okay, and so the key one on this one is that pressure would have had to be constant. Okay, and probably in order to make the temperature increase, what we were doing is we were adding heat to the system. Okay, and so this this relationship is generally true if, again, <laughs> the volume is changing kind of in reaction to the temperature changing. Okay, but what if instead the volume changes really quickly and the temperature is changing in reaction to that? And so let's think about this concept. Okay, so I have a vessel. Okay, and it's kind of a rhombus for some reason. But here's all these gas particles. And we know their gas particles are moving around, they're moving fast. Okay, all of a sudden, quickly, I squish this box. I make it much, much smaller. And all the thermal energy that these particles had from there moving around has been compressed into this smaller space. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, so all the, the amount of thermal energy they had out here when they had all this moved, room to move around is now in a smaller space. So again, I like to think about, you know, maybe this is a gym and all the particles of gas are people. And they're running, they're doing full sprint. They're running until they hit a wall and then they turn around and they sprint the other way. And this is okay. We probably have room to avoid each other in this situation. But if we take all that energy, everybody has the same amount of kinetic energy, they're still just running full sprints, and we put them in a much, much smaller space, they're all going to bump into each other a lot more, right? If they try to keep going the same space, they're going to bump into each other a lot more, they're going to have friction against each other, and our temperature is going to increase. Okay, so I kind of like to think of it as, you know, this relationship is true if the temperature changes and the volume is changing in reaction to that. But the kind of opposite is true, okay, when we allow pressure to change, but we don't let, um, not no temp, no thermal energy change. Okay, because the temperature is going to change, right? The, all the thermal energy is going to be squeezed in a smaller space, and so the temperature is actually going to increase. So we have this kind of idea that as this decreases, now this is going to increase. Okay, so that's something that's adiabatic, okay? There's no thermal energy change. So if the volume compresses really fast, the temperature is going to increase because that thermal energy is just kind of being concentrated. You could think of it that way. And the opposite is also true, right? If I took a gas and I all of a sudden expanded and gave it more space, it's going to get cooler. Okay, so let's kind of walk into that here. 
So when work is done by a gas adiabatically, by compressing it, the gas gains internal energy and becomes warmer. Um, so here's the idea. No heat enters or leaves. Okay. So no heat enters or leaves, but it is still going to gain internal energy. Remember, because we're going to have um, friction. We just have things kind of concentrated. I like to think of it as being concentrated. Um, and so changes of volume can be achieved by performing the process rapidly, which is what we're going to talk about happens in like an engine and a piston, um, or by thermally insulating a system. Okay, so one way or the other, we're going to stop heat from entering or leaving, and then instead of temperature and volume being directly proportional, we're going to have temperature and volume being inversely proportional, okay? Because we are not allowing heat to enter or leave. And it's kind of a sometimes a weird one to wrap your brain around. Um, so again, if it expands really quickly, it is going to get colder, and that is a big big factor when we're talking about weather. Okay, so we have you know air near the ground. It's warm and it's humid, and it gets pushed up into the sky, there's less air pressure up there, right? So in the less air pressure, it's going to expand quickly because it's under less pressure, so it's going to expand quickly, it's going to get cooler, and that's when we have the condensation of liquid droplets and the development of clouds. So it's a pretty uh, big idea here. <sighs> Okay, and so here's this concept here. Change in air temperature is this little squiggly means uh, directly proportional to. Okay, which means as the pressure change is in the same direction as the air temperature. So all of a sudden the pressure goes up the temperature goes up. All of a sudden the pressure goes down, the temperature goes down. Okay, And this is kind of just an interesting thing, I think. The temperature of a mass of dry air drops by 10 degrees Celsius for each kilometer increase in altitude. So as it's going up, it's getting colder every kilometer by about 10 degrees. So um, let's kind of talk about when in our world besides clouds this is important. And we'll talk about it again in a little while, but um, if you've heard a car referred to by how many cylinders it has, um, eh, oh boy, I'm not an artist. This is getting worse and worse. Okay, um, so we're gonna let a little bit of gas in here. Okay, and then, so we're going to let that in there. It's going to be like aerosolized, like it's like a tiny little squirt of that gasoline. So it's like, you know, kind of floating around in here. And very, very quickly that cylinder is going to compress. All of a sudden that cylinder goes down, and now it's concentrated in this tiny little thing. Okay, and so it essentially combusts in there. And that pushes the cylinder back up, and the exhaust goes out the other side. And then that is like the power stroke. That's what pushes um, everything in your engine. So we kind of have this system of gas in, it squeezes, it compresses, and it pushes it out. Okay, and this, this combustion in here pushing the cylinder back up that kind of keeps the process going, keeps your engine moving, keeps moving parts going. And so it combusts in there because it gets so hot because it's being compressed adiabatically. All right. So second and third laws of thermodynamics. Um, second one says heat will never of itself flow from a cold object to a hot object, which is kind of the exact reverse of how I usually would say it. I would say the second law of thermodynamics says heat generally flows from hot to cold. Okay, and then we have this idea of unless 
work is done. Okay, so we can force heat from cold to hot. That's what your refrigerator does, right? But it doesn't happen naturally. We have to add electricity. We have to have a lot of moving parts and uh, refrigerant chemicals and all those kinds of things. Um, so this is kind of how I would generally phrase the second law. Things, temperature, or heat moves from hot to cold unless we do work, okay? Um, so they say never of itself. That means if we don't add work, it's not going to go backwards, basically, um, which is kind of what the second bullet point is. All right, um, third law of thermodynamics, which they didn't feel like bolding for some reason, says no system can reach absolute zero. Okay, so physicists have been able to get things cold, really cold, like within, a de within one Kelvin of absolute zero. Okay, um, yeah, they say... Uh, less than a millionth of one Kelvin. But why do you think we can't get down to zero? Okay, so think about an individual atom. All right, so we have our protons and neutrons in the nucleus and our electrons flying out here. And remember, electrons, they're in the electron cloud. They're moving around. They're going fast out here. What would happen if we reach absolute zero, which means there is no motion, okay? So the only thing keeping the electrons from being pulled into the nucleus is their motion, is their momentum. So if we got down to zero Kelvin, they would not have a mo enough momentum to keep away from the nucleus. They get sucked into the nucleus, and all matter's volume would just collapse, right? Because, like, almost all of the... Uh, atoms volume is the empty space that's kind of filled by the motion of electrons. So all of a sudden if that motion ceases, they get pulled into the nucleus. Like I said, all matter is going to be sucked down to a very, 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 very small percentage of its original volume and where our, our entire universe is basically going to implode upon itself. So, you know, we, uh, for the um, There's a word, and I'm really struggling to think of it. The integrity. For the integrity of the atom, we cannot get to absolute zero because it would just kind of all the rules of how atoms work would not work anymore. Um, so I'm going to type up a few questions over these two sections. As always, let me know if you need any help. But mostly you should be able to figure it out from just those two sections of the review that I just, or a summary that I looked over. Let me know if you need any help. Later.